Hey, what's good self-direct investors? I hope you're all doing great and I want to welcome you back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jordan. I'm the mind behind Make More Capital and today we're coming at you with this week in cannabis news from November 7th to the 13th. Now, before we jump in, if you enjoy this video or you learn something, please just leave a like on it as it really helps out my channel. And of course, if you want to learn how to take advantage of this generational investment opportunity, subscribe below so that you don't miss any future videos. And then there's plenty of content for you to go back, rewatch, and educate yourself with. I've tried to put all the news and facts in one place so that you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the industry, identify top companies that you keep seeing pop up, and take advantage whenever you feel ready if you wish to do so. And while it would be nice to have some definitive election results, I'm recording this video at 11.30 a.m. on Saturday, November 12th. So while we don't have those yet, uh, we're going to just focus on the facts and the news that we did get this week. So we're going to start with True Leave as they report their third quarter 2022 results and drives forward progress on strategic vision. And while these were quite disappointing um, in terms of what people were expecting, it just does highlight that sometimes mergers and acquisition are a lot messier than uh, than we are led to believe is. So just gonna go through the highlights though. Revenue increased 34% year over year to 301 million with gap gross margin of 56%. Industry leading US retail network of 176 dispensaries still uh, playing the big footprint game supported by over 4 million square feet of cultivation and processing capacity. While they believe their capital, data, distribution and scaled capacity position truly for Cannabis 2.0. And what is Cannabis 2.0 exactly? I'm sure everyone's definition is different but likely the next incremental changes and just continued reform that we'll see over time. And so here you can pause to read the Q3 2022 financial and operational highlights. Um, but yeah, the main thing, it just seems like, uh, I think quarter over quarter, going down from 318 million last quarter to 301 million this quarter. Unfortunate, but just highlights as well when you don't uh, pick up assets in new states that are expected to launch like New Jersey. Uh, unfortunately, you do suffer sequentially, but at the same time, um, it's unfortunate that politics just keeps getting in the way of this industry. And of course, you just think that if, if politicians wanted to work out in the best interest of their constituents and wanted to create jobs and tax revenue, then we would see states reform their laws quickly and try and get these these adult use markets up on time. Unfortunately, that's the reality. Um, but, you know, kudos to True Leave and all these MSOs for operating with both hands behind their back uh, and continuing to to push through. And so their outlook as we uh, we anticipate fourth quarter results will be influenced by holiday retail performance and promotional activity across core markets during the latter half of the quarter. Based on our performance year to date in current trends, we are targeting the low end of 2022 guidance of 1.25 billion and 1.3 billion. Again, not having exposure to New Jersey, we were expecting True Leaves growth to, to slow down a little bit. Um, unfortunately, probably Hurricane Ian did have a bit of an impact too, um, but in revenue and then 415 to 450 million in adjusted EBIT. Still fairly good for companies operating again with both hands behind their backs um having to pay predatory 280e taxes but yeah main thing to highlight is just that quarter over quarter seeing it go from 319 million sorry i think i said 318 down to 301 that is obviously not ideal to see but if we look year over year it's still up from 633 million i think that would have been pre-harvest acquisition close um but up to 938 so still 48 percent year over year uh, hopefully they can get to free cash flow positive um, by next, but hopefully by quarter's end. Um, obviously, it doesn't look like they might, um, and it just depends how well things go. But you know, kudos to True Leaf. Good luck with that. Um, and just wanted to share a deeper breakdown from Seishu Metacharla on True Leaf's uh, third quarter 2022 earnings. Uh, his takeaway here as someone who has more of a background in finance, uh, doing more of a deep dive. So thank you, Seishu, for sharing this, so I can share with my audience. You can pause to read from one, two, three, and four. And then scroll down from five, six, seven, and eight. You can pause to read. Then go down to nine, 10, 11, 12. You can pause to read. And then overall, uh, and then last one, all the way down to end, you can pause to read as well. And so with that, we also did get Air Wellness as they reported their third quarter 2022 results. And so just a few quick highlights, revenue up 24% year over year to 119.6 million, up 9% 9 9 sequentially. And so again, we just, in this in circumstance, we wanna thank God that New Jersey finally did launch uh, after all the delays in April of 2021. And that is what gave Air Wellness that, that little bit of growth that, you know, obviously we're expecting, we're hoping a bit more had they been approved on time but for a company that is more of a tier two as opposed to a tier one uh and the risk is a bit higher for for many of these reasons um you know it's just nice to see them get that growth that we were expecting from new jersey adjusted ebitda or earnings before interest taxes depreciation and amortization up 10 percent sequentially to 21.7 million while their operating loss improved 17 percent sequentially again likely due to the uh the offset of new jersey finally launching and so uh good to see air wellness at least bounce back uh well, again, we saw that they were delayed in opening their legal adult use dispensaries in New Jersey. They did get that online. 
Um, and so looking ahead, they anticipate further growth from the optimization and ramping up of our existing asset base, as well as a number of new catalysts that we expect to begin contributing by early next year. The closing of our acquisition of two dispensary 33 retail locations in Illinois, the opening of 15 new Florida stores, and the commencement of sales from our state-of-the-art cultivation facility in Ohio, and the continued phase openings of our Massachusetts cultivation expansion will be key growth and profit drivers in 2023. And so the main thing, as long as Air Wellness has New Jersey now going forward and they can cut costs, they're going to be an impressive you know, tier two MSO and likely a, a potential attractive M&A acquisition in time. And so despite the difficult first half of the year that Air and all MSO saw, especially when we look at Q3 of 2021 and Air was looking as good as ever at that point, um, it's just nice to see Q3 up from Q2 uh, by 8.6%. And so while this is sort of the change that we're used to seeing in this industry, uh, the year over year change is again, not that impressive, but main thing is at least New Jersey's online. Hopefully that will help drive sales to offset any other M&A costs and Air Wellness can do what they need to do to cut costs uh, and get themselves ready. So third quarter uh, and recent highlights, retail updates, brand product updates, regulatory updates, and so you can pause to read um, here if you'd like to get a bit more info out of that. Uh, and while I just wanted to focus on their outlook as well, so what do they anticipate going forward based on the results to date coupled with an uncertain macroeconomic backdrop, uncertain for everybody, of course, management is updating their assumptions underlying its previously issued guidance. And so that is to be expected, but consistent with prior quarter sequential growth trends, the company expects adjusted EBITDA and operating income to grow approximately 10% sequentially from Q3 2022 to Q4 and expects further growth in 2023 as future milestones come online. And so more kicking the can down the road and sort of all aspects that we're seeing this, but we have to adapt and roll with the punches. Not easy for them as well. I imagine not easy for any industry uh, in, these, in this environment, but this guidance assumes further price compression in the wholesale and retail market, while AIR's expectations for future results are based on the assumptions and risks detailed in its M MDNA for the period and it's September 30th, 2022, as filed on CDAR and with the SEC. And so unfortunately, I do not have that. But of course, before doing, you know, investing, you should try to read through as many uh, company documents, uh, this one included, as possible. And so that is most of it for Air Wellness. You can grab these links below if you wanted to check it out. But so just to recap what the week did do for us as political highlights, nearly half of Americans will now live in states where cannabis is legal. As after Maryland and Missouri, two states with populations of about 6 million Americans passed legalization referendums on Tuesday, it is now legal in 21 states for anyone ages 21 and up to possess cannabis. So great job, Maryland and Missouri. The citizens voted for it. You get what you deserve. Um, while unfortunately three other state re measures were rejected, and that was in Arkansas, South Dakota, North Dakota. So unfortunate for you folks, uh, you get what you vote for as well. That really sucks uh, that you don't get a safer non addictive medicinal alternative, more tax revenue, more jobs, and you know more of all the good things that ending cannabis prohibitions brings and so if you wanted to read this whole article link will be below but on top of that i just wanted to share how quickly some states can move much like arizona did we love to see this out of missouri and so you don't have to be shitty like new york or new uh, or new jersey you can just get the ball rolling benefit those in your states and get adult use launched as soon as possible so thank you tom angle for reporting this big missouri regulators have already issued proposed rules for the adult use cannabis market just two days after voters approve legalization on the ballot and this is likely because they're not focusing on social equity and that's not how any business should be built should be from the ground up, not from top down, uh, implementing tight regulations and then trying to engineer it. It's just, that's not how it'll work. And we've seen that through states uh, over time. And so with that though, they say recreational cannabis sales can begin as early as February in Missouri. That would be huge. They passed the ballot in November, December, January, February launch already. It's just like Arizona that we saw. It took them 58 days to launch. Um, and so more on this article below if you wanted to check it out. But this was as of November 11th. So huge. Love to see this. Um, obviously, hopefully Maryland will take the same sort of approach. But... Fortunately, it doesn't seem like that might be the case. As we read from the Baltimore Sun, Maryland voted to legalize adult use recreational cannabis. Now what? And now again, we don't know it's still early, but Marylanders voted two to one for legalizing rec cannabis. That was the easy part. But what's going to get in the way in Maryland, possibly? We don't necessarily know, but I'm just trying to point the point the facts or at least provide the receipts in the facts because look, look at the approach Maryland wants to take as opposed to Missouri. Now state lawmakers will try to set up a legal market that is safe equitable we know that unfortunate buzzword that ruins everything and affordable that's the hard part well yes we are aware that the war on drugs was racist and it did proportionally target black americans and latino americans and americans of different skin colors uh, as opposed to white people the reality is just you know handing out licenses based on skin color is also racism and the best thing we should try and do is pool every eligible candidate together have them all apply and pick the best candidates that have the best 
possibility of creating long-term businesses for those in the state that they're going to create jobs and tax revenue for. Now, that's just my opinion. I could be wrong, but just wanted to highlight because I think it's funny. Side by side, we see the difference between Maryland and then Missouri um, as lawmakers, industry leaders, and social justice advocates are all hoping to avoid a similarly slow and inequitable rollout for recreational cannabis. But as a byproduct of hoping for this, this is exactly what I think they're going to get. So I'm not going to dive into this article because it just makes me angry because we've seen this botched in many states already. Link will be below if you wanted to check it out. But this is a prime example of that same experiment. We're going to see one state not focusing on social equity, probably launching first Missouri in February, and then we'll see hopefully Maryland doesn't drag out that late. But just thought that was very interesting to be able to contrast those two. And so with that, though, uh, more state uh, and election victories for cannabis is 21 Rhode Island communities approve cannabis retail sales. So good job to these 25 communities in Rhode Island, again, creating jobs, tax revenue and ending cannabis prohibition and bringing in benefits already as residents in 31 cities and towns voted Tuesday if cannabis businesses should be allowed to open in the communities where they live. Um, and so 25 of the 31 apparently voted for yes. And so the question on the ballot, shall cannabis related licenses for businesses involved in the cultivation, manufacture, laboratory testing, and for the retail sale of adult use recreational use cannabis be issued um, in the city or town. And the vote was rejected by these uh, these ones where retailers will be bound or where will be banned, sorry. And then the referendum was approved in all of these areas here. And municipalities that didn't hold a vote will allow cannabis to open there regardless. And so that means more communities than not will be open to that idea. And so a bit more information here if you wanted to pause to read. Um, but it seems rec sales are starting at existing med cannabis dispensaries on December 1st in Rhode Island. Uh, and future store locations have not yet been proposed, uh, but the state law allows there to be 33 stores statewide. And so starting small, hopefully they can expand to properly supply the demand. But of course, Rhode Island has a uh, much smaller population than a lot of other states. And so with that, though, we also see Connecticut as these Connecticut towns will now allow recreational cannabis sales. Um, and so recreational cannabis is already legal in Connecticut, although they have not launched adult use yet. But the question of selling cannabis was on Tuesday's ballot in three municipalities. And so Ledyard passed the referendum by nearly 300 votes, while Litchfield voters decided to prohibit the selling of rec cannabis, their loss, and unfortunately, they won't see the benefit of the real estate values going up, uh, which does happen in states that legalize for adult use, open up dispensaries, uh, obviously creates jobs, tax revenue, and decreases the amount of opioid overdoses. And so, again, sadly, their loss. Hopefully, they'll wake up at one point, but then Waterbury voters only approved it by about 400 votes, as if these are so close for comfort. But I guess if you, you're not exposed to it, you don't know the benefits of banning cannabis prohibition. So it's a small step in the right direction for Connecticut. Um, and while they were supposed to apparently launch their adult use market by the end of the year, uh, this is pretty much the only update we got. Connecticut's first retail shop is expected to open by the end of the year or early next year. And so again, the can just keeps getting kicked down the road. And I don't know why politicians clearly don't seem to want to work in the best interests of their constituents. Otherwise, this would have been a no-brainer a long time ago for a lot of states that are still lagging behind. And so a few more stories though. This one out of New York, uh, very big. I don't know the whole depths of it yet so just wanted to share it and we'll try and dig a bit more over the weekend uh, but this is absolutely huge thank you jeremy burke who writes for business insider trading for sharing this um, but firstly just to share the tweet uh, the original tweet sam reisman uh, thank you sam reisman at the reisman for sharing this justin a new york federal judge has enjoined basically blocking similar to what we've seen in illinois which is so infuriating new york cannabis regulators from issuing any retail licenses for finger lakes central new york western new york mid hudson and his home borough of brooklyn and so this is as of november 10th why? I don't know. Social equity is the only thing I can imagine. Like, it's it's infuriating. Um, so there's a bit more down here if you wanted to pause to read and some resources that he includes. Um, and so link will be below if you wanted to check those out. So just wanted to share this at least um, as something relevant and a bit more information if you wanted to read into it. But it's huge, and I think in a bad way, not a good way. It means no dispensaries can open in any of these five regions, including Brooklyn, where 19 licenses were supposed to be awarded until the lawsuit is settled. We know how long a lawsuit can take. And so, so much for a lot of these dispensaries possibly being open by the end of this year. Again, horseshit. New York couldn't have done this worse. It's it's so infuriating. And so again, that's what happens when you let politics and regulators and ideology, unfortunately, get in the way. And so more on the story from Leafly, breaking a federal lawsuit will delay 63 of 150 New York dispensary licenses. So man, that's a big chunk. Fortunately, hopefully these ones, the, the rest of them can still get online, but it again, just throws a, a wrench, throwing a wrench in rec rollout uh, until the case is resolved. So again, so infuriating. And Sam Hall just said, yeah, New York's dispensary rollout has been so bad. It's pathetic. It's infuriating. It almost, it's embarrassing. It's fucking ridiculous. Anyways, on to the next one, Aaron Idleheight. Just wanted to share this as I found it and came across it yesterday. Uh, might be interesting to note because at least it's more beneficial for any of the growers that remain in California and continue to grow. Um, but the equivalent of 6 million square feet of cultivation licenses 
were not renewed in the last 60 days in California. Did I hear this right, Graham Ferraro? And so thank you, Aaron, for posing the question. We've got a bit of a response from Graham. So again, take these with a grain of salt, but uh, you know these are, we think, individuals that take pride in their answers and their integrity. Uh, and so obviously they have an incentive to try and be honest and share accurate info. But uh, Graham adds uh, to the answer a little bit. The exact number uh, is less or you know, 624 outdoor licenses less, so 624 did not renew. Uh, 86 did not renew mixed light licenses and four small increase, and a small increase in indoor licenses. So the timing was actually over the last four months. He misspoke when he said 60 days, so um, a bit more. Outdoor square foot down 14% in the last month. Uh, another 794 come due over the next two months, and so I'll try to update you on this. Um, but again, just it's interesting because unfortunately, the difficult environment, the illicit market, and the high taxes by idiot policy and politicians, unfortunately has made it very difficult and it sucks for all these cultivators. I feel for them, it's very unfortunate, but at the same time, it does make it more beneficial for all the cultivators who can continue to operate and continue to legally supply the demand if California can bounce back, right? And so uh, each license is for 10,000 square foot of growing canopy. So negative 6.2 million square foot of outdoor compared to 60 days ago, possibly, or um, four months ago, and then there has been a decrease of 860,000 square foot of mixed lighting compared to four months ago. And so that's actual canopy too. So really far larger than our entire SoCal farm, totally filled up, uh, left the ecosystem. And so sucks for those cultivators. My heart goes out to them. But, you know, again, good for some of the MSOs and cultivators that have that footprint still in California. And hopefully if we can get through these dog days in the difficult environment, they can bounce back in time. And so a few more state stories. This one from Jeremy Burke again. Cowan says, Minnesota has the best chance of legalizing in 2023 through the state legislature, followed by Oklahoma and Ohio via, via special election. So, um, you know, if there's a silver lining to the election, could be that some states did end up flipping and cannabis legalization uh, might be more forthcoming than it would have been expected. Other states to watch Delaware, Kansas, uh, and North Carolina for medical. And so this is a little snippet from Cowan if you wanted to just basically summarize what he said there. Uh, and so again, take this with a grain of salt though. We don't know uh, how soon that could be, but another one from Tom Angle sharing. Pennsylvania uh, has its best chance to legalize cannabis yet with Democrats claiming a majority in the House of Reps. Uh, a new pro-reform governor being elected and at least two GOP senators on record for ending cannabis prohibition. And so we don't know anything yet. We do know that GOP senators were trying to make a push for legalization in 2023, but this is probably the best case scenario for cannabis reform in Pennsylvania that we could have hoped for. And so more on this article below, if you want to check it out, I will cover developments uh, as we do get more stories, but that's uh, technically a positive for cannabis, I would say. Well, Tom Engel, thanks for sharing this one. His newly re-elected re Wisconsin governor, Tony Evers, said he'll include cannabis legalization in the budget he's submitting to lawmakers early in 2023, despite GOP leaders opposition at some point in time the will of the people will become the law of the land and uh, respect to at least Tony Evers trying to work in the best interests of the people of Wisconsin and his constituents uh, you know versus uh, GOP leaders wanting to get in the way and so more on this story down there if you wanted to check it out and so last few ones just wanted to share so again take this with a grain of salt as it is speculation but sharing uh, what I found that might be relevant at all so thank you Lance Finlinson who uh, take it with a grain of salt not investment advice fair enough I won't take it as that, but he said, heard on a conference call tonight that the safe moving through now will not allow MSOs to uplift. Fair enough. We've heard that many times. Came from a cannabis roundtable member. will just allow access to banking. And so again, I think that's still the next step we need, and that will hopefully trigger what's next, but still, uh, that could be true. And so thank you, Andrew uh, Malinowski, for asking this great question. What does it take to update FinCEN guidance regarding cannabis rescheduling lower? Uh, what about timeframes on that? So many questions, very relevant questions. So thanks for asking that, Andrew. And at least Jeff Schultz did come with this fairly good answer. Safe explicitly requires FinCEN to update its guidance within 180 days of passage. And so while it doesn't explicitly allow for any uplisting like that, if it does explicitly require FinCEN to update its guidance within 180 days of passage, that update is what could allow for other changes to come that could allow for uplisting. Again, it takes time. It's annoying that we can't just get one definitive answer that we want, but this seems to be the process. And so just wanted to share this. So while everything's still up in the air and there's lots of talk, there are no definitive answers. So all we can really do is plan accordingly for our own situation, but just trying to share what could possibly be the outcomes as I am betting for something to pass. The stage is set, and while we might not get something, I'm also prepared for us not to get what we're expecting. And so, no idea. Best of luck out there, folks, and let's just hope that the next three months are very interesting and they end up being uh, somewhat profitable for us, at least a lot more profitable than the last 18 months. And so, last few shares, just wanted to share this interesting one from the National Cannabis Roundtable. As they tweet, unacceptable to allow for policy that prioritizes foreign interests over American companies, which is a very fair take, especially from an organization whose job it is to try and help the U.S. cannabis industry thrive and survive during these very difficult times. And so, uh, this comes from an article from Yahoo! 
finance. So take it with a grain of salt as well as it quotes Pablo Fitzgerald, an analyst for Cantor. And this is just his take. And so uh, titled Forget About Safe Plus or Climb Act as Cannabis Stock Catalyst with Canopy's Potential Exception. So he seems to think that uh, if safe doesn't pass, there might be a benefit uh, to Canopy exercising their options that they made in the past to acquire U.S. assets, uh, despite NASDAQ not necessarily approving it yet, but apparently having the approval from the TSX. So again, a lot is up in the air. We have no idea, but this is what Pablo seems to think uh, right now. CGC could be in a great position to further acquire U.S. assets in the months ahead, uh, with likely expanding opportunities if the status quo remains. What? Or if the 117th Congress does not pass uh, banking reform during the lame duck session. So he seems to think that if, if SAFE doesn't get passed in the lame duck session, there could still be possible positive catalysts for the U.S. cannabis industry, or at least for Canopy, and I don't know if that would be a win for the U.S. cannabis industry. You'd like to think so, but it might not be. And so, lastly, to round this off, indeed, CGC could be steps ahead of peers, or they could not be, as they haven't been in the past, or as they've shown that they have not been for a long time, which may have less flexibility. So, we don't know. Just wanted to share this interesting take, though. Let me know in the comments what you think. And then, so lastly, just wanted to jump to this as the Ontario Cannabis Store provides a quarterly review from January 1st to March 31st, 2022. And so while this is quite old, I just wanted to bring it up uh, to mainly highlight Q4 and just a few things that the data tells us about consumers uh, and about the reality of ending cannabis prohibition and legalizing. Because in the big picture, uh, the first month that this data was compiled, I think it was 26% of sales came from legal outlets, while 74% came from illegal. And now when you open more dispensary outlets, of course, you can see that more people are willing to purchase legal cannabis. And so how do you get rid of the illicit market, you end cannabis prohibition and you launch legal adult use markets. It's a no-brainer, obviously, and the data speaks for itself. And so this, of course, has been helped by Ontario, the most populated province, opening 120 stores a month too. They have no, now over a thousand dispensary legal outlets where people can go to as opposed to going to the black market. It does make a difference. And get this though, the difference, total grams sold, people want to go to stores that they do not want to buy from the government. Fuck the government as they continue to uh, to dig themselves a deeper hole, but just highlights that 61.3 million um, grams were sold at retail stores, just 2.4 million sold from the government website. And so this is why you don't want to get crappy uh, government involved in uh, in business operations. A uh, number of retail stores, thankfully, again, this was driven by 1,460 outlets to get this legal cannabis to Canadians. And so again, highlighting just the difference in sales, total sales in Ontario, 390.4 million from retail stores, just 14.6 million from the government website. Uh, of course, the Ontario share of national rec uh, sales, it makes, uh, or it's been a big driver of the growth, 40% in Ontario. Um, the second highest share is actually Alberta, which has, I think, 3 million people less than Quebec, but 400, or at least 500, I think, more stores. And again, that is why there's more growth, because you open more stores, you take uh, sales out of the illicit market. It's just common sense. Uh, while British Columbia is actually in third, leaving Quebec in fourth place, despite the fact that Quebec has 8 million people, our second most populated province. And so again, this is what you get when they want to control government monopoly, not open stores, and just keep profits for themselves. And so sad case, but this is the rest of Canada broken down there. Uh, this is the big picture. You can pause to read a little bit uh, from this graphic here, but just highlighting you know, the sales growth across the board. Um, and then the main other thing I wanted to get through sales data, uh, and it just highlights dried flour. Flour remains king for the most part, 50% of sales. Um, Pre-rolled, 18% of sales. Vapes, 16%. Edibles, 5%. Concentrates, 5%. Oils, 2%. Beverages, 2%. But again, uh, beverages are much more tightly and highly regulated in Canada uh, than they would be in the U.S. And so that is a main reason why they remained so low at 2%, especially if I go to a dispensary, I can only buy four or five at a time because technically more than 30 grams went into making those four or five cans. And the legal dispensaries are, or the dispensaries are not allowed to legally sell more than 30 grams at a time. And if 30 grams went into making my five drinks, that's the most I can buy. It's so stupid, but that's why we're at where we're at with capsules, topicals, and seeds at 1% or less than 1%. So just wanted to show you this as again, hey, you know, once we do legalize and we get the data in, it does highlight a lot about cannabis consumers, um, what people like, what people don't like, but the fact that ending cannabis prohibition does provide jobs, tax revenue, all the benefits. Um, and, you know, we are seeing that at least in Canada, in legal states in real time, and hopefully new states that reform their laws will see that as well. But that is it for today's episode, folks. So I want to thank you so much for tuning in, and I really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. Uh, but besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos and I will catch you on Wednesday for a midweek update. Have a great weekend, everybody.